The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. In these waning days of 2020, surely we could all do with some reasons to smile. And that's where we start tonight, talking to author Peter Jennings about his new book about the Ontario woman whose songs had Frank Sinatra singing about a smile. Then we'll find out how Juno-nominated singer-songwriter M. Griner launched her latest recordings into this COVID-induced online music world. And we check in with the folks at the Jazz Bistro in downtown T.O. to find out how live music venues are weathering why there's no sun up in the sky stormy weather well it is the music show it's wednesday december 9th and that's all tonight on the agenda's annual holiday season music show there's an old expression it's frank sinatra's world we just live in it a lot of people are going to be remembering that expression in three days because Saturday represents the 105th anniversary of Old Blue Eyes' birth. What you may not know is that two of Sinatra's favorite songs and biggest hits were written by a woman from Toronto who's the subject of a new book called Until I Smile at You, How One Girl's Heartbreak Electrified Frank Sinatra's Fame. And it brings its author, Peter Jennings, to our virtual studio from Midland, Ontario, on the southeastern tip of Georgian Bay. Peter, it's great to have you with us tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Steve, and thank you very much for having me on the agenda. I must tell you, it's one of my favorite shows. I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you. Well, start by taking us back. We're going back more than 80 years right now to a young woman in Toronto by the name of Ruth Lowenthal, as she then was, who fancied herself a songwriter. How did she get into that? Well, uh, her father was quite musical, and so they always had a piano in the house. And Ruth was, Steve, she was a natural-born talent. Uh, both she and her sister Muriel played the piano a bit, but Muriel stopped, Ruth kept going, and uh, then she worked in uh, uh, music stores in Toronto where she would play songs, sheet music, and that sort of thing. And uh, so she was a natural talent. And then in 1936, Ina Ray Hutton, who had a famous band called, wait for it, The Melodiers, <laughs> which I love, it was an all-female band, and they were traveling through uh, the U.S., and they were coming to Toronto for a one-night stand, and Ina Ray's piano player took sick. So Ina Ray Hutton calls Toronto and says, I need to audition all the good-looking blonde piano players you've got, and by the way, if she can arrange, that would be a bonus. Um, make a long story short, Ruth auditions, she gets the gig, she plays the Toronto uh, show. Ina Ray is so impressed, she says, join our band. And so for the next uh, two years, Ruth Lowe toured around uh, the U.S. and bits of Canada playing with the Melodiers. Now that's, that's really how she got home. Yeah, that's the happy part of the story, but there's some. it's punctuated by some tragedy as well. She lost her father to suicide along the way. And then in 1939, she's married, she's in love, and what happens to her husband, Harold? She has married Harold Cohen, who's a very handsome song plugger. You're right, they're young in love, they're planning a family. Harold goes into uh, the hospital in Chicago for what's supposed to be a routine operation, but he dies on the operating table. And Ruth is just devastated. She's pulled apart. She's in so much grief. She goes back home to Toronto where she moves in with her mother, Pearl, and her sister, Muriel, or Mickey, the friends. And uh, she just sits there staring out the window, just uh, full of grief. And I actually talked to uh, Mickey. Uh, she died, uh, sadly, earlier this year, in the 100th year. But she told me, she said, Peter, one day, Ruthie just looked at me and said, Mickey, I'll never smile again. And Mickey told me that night the song just poured out of her soul, the, the words music. She wrote the song literally in the night. And that became this. Sheldon, if you would, please. <laughs> Within my heart I know Smile 
again Until I smile at you Until I smile at you Who's the boy singer there, Peter? <laughs> that would be Frankie. It sure would be. Who's the guy on the trombone? Yeah. That'd be Tommy Dorsey. How did he get a hold uh, of the song? Well, what happened was Ruth uh, began work at the CDC, and Percy Faith had, was working at the CDC in those days, and he had a show called Music by Faith, and one day he walked by Ruthie's office, and she's playing the piano, she's singing the song, and he's going, hey, what is that? I like it. May I record it tonight on my show? So he does up a marvelous arrangement with, you know, strings and horns and a singer, and and uh, it goes out in the CBC long before Tommy Dorsey or, or Frank Sinatra ever heard of it. But um, what happens is he presents Ruth with a record of that uh, song. She gets it to a friend of hers who's connected to Dorsey. Dorsey listens to it, loves the song, eventually hires Sinatra, and in May of uh, 1940, they went into the RCA Victor studio in New York City and recorded the song, and hearts went a flutter around the world. There have been, I think, over 150 people have recorded the song since then. And here's what somebody named Nancy Sinatra, whom you quote in the book, thinks about it. There's a reason why I'll Never Smile Again has endured. It was a perfect song, interpreted by the perfect singer at the perfect time. It was a meeting of honesty, the fundamental quality my dad possessed, and the heartfelt plaintive cry of a young grieving widow. Ruth's lyrics bespoke vulnerability, and as America became immersed in the war, they became deeply meaningful to millions of girls on the home front. Peter, this song went to number one for 12 weeks. It was Tommy Dorsey's biggest hit ever. It was selected mm -hmm. in 1958 as one of the best pop songs of all time. I, I, I have a bit of an odd question here, which is, do you know how Ruth dealt with the fact that her greatest professional success came out of the worst misery she could imagine? She, uh, it, it's a great question, Steve. She was a very positive person. And uh, notwithstanding the fact she was consumed by grief for uh, so long after Harold died, once she realized that she had a hit tune, she, uh, she went down to New York City at Tommy Dorsey's uh, request, and she was down there for about three years and wrote, uh, boy, up to 50 different tunes for Broadway and Hollywood. And, of course, was, uh, she wrote uh, Sinatra's uh, theme song, Put Your Dreams Away. But, uh, yeah, I, and, and funny enough, one of the questions I had in writing the book was if you consider the other songs of 1940, the, the competitors, if you will, they're all uh, up-tempo beat, uh, you know, from Hollywood and Broadway, I love you and life's grand and all that sort of thing, and designed to put people on the dance floor. That's what the orchestras were for. And I thought to myself, how did this almost dirge-like slow ballad overtake all these other songs, Pennsylvania 6, 5,000 and all these songs, and, and become number one, as you said, on Billboard for 12 weeks, setting all sorts of records. And so to get an answer for that, I, I talked to uh, a number of uh, pretty well-known songwriters, people, people like Bernie Taupin. Uh, Bernie's written lyrics for Sir Elton John for 50 years. Uh, Sir Tim Rice, who writes the lyrics for Andrew Lloyd Webber. Alan Bergman, who's written songs for Barbara Streisand and, and Sinatra himself. Um, and, and many other people, and I asked them, uh, how did this happen? And basically, they were all in awe of Ruth and her ability to write beautiful songs. They, they basically said, talent always shines through, and uh, that's why the song was such a hit. But there's no question the connection with World War II had a huge amount to do with it, right? There were so many widows whose husbands were not coming home from fighting overseas, right. and they thought they'd never smile again either, I bet. 
Yes, exactly. And and in fact, there was a rumor that Ruth, in fact, had lost her husband flying in a mission overseas. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, nor, I mean, nor was she uh, uh, American. She was, in fact, Canadian. But this rumor got uh, got out there for some time. But you're absolutely right. It was a time of war, looming war, and uh, people were worried about losing their loved ones. So it really connected. Peter, I think your next mission in life has got to be to contact Barbara Streisand or Lady Gaga and get them to record it. Because I know 150 other artists have done it, but they would absolutely lift it off the page like no one else. What do you think? I, I think it's a great idea, and I'm on that, Steve. I'll do it. <laughs> I think Lady, Lady Gaga did that beautiful album with uh, Tony Bennett. I mean, she would nail it for sure. Absolutely. And of course, Barbara Streisand uh, just <laughs> never does wrong. Well, I'm on it, man. <laughs> good. I'm glad you're on that one next. When Frank Sinatra was buried in 1998, the last song played at his funeral, we should tell people, was not my way. It was not New York, New York. It was this. Sheldon, over to you. Put your dreams away for another day And I will take their place in your Wishing on a star Never got you far And so it's time to make A new start When your dreams at night mm. His voice <clears throat> Her talent, what a combination. What's the genesis of that song, please, Peter? Well, it's actually a funny, uh, quite a funny story, uh, Steve, and I, I do recount that in the book and tell that smile with you. Uh, basically, it's 1943, and, and oh, by the way, I, I tracked down uh, Lindy Kahn in Houston, Texas. She is the daughter of Paul Mann, who co-wrote the music for this song with his uh, songwriting buddy, Stefan Weiss. And we kind of pulled together what happened. It's 1943, Ruth answers the phone, and it's Sinatra. He says, hey, doll, I need you to write me a song. And she says, a song, Frankie? What, what do you want? And he says, well, CBS is giving me my own uh, radio show. And you can practically see his chest bursting with pride at this. And he said, uh, I need a song that's going to start or end uh, each show. It'll be kind of my theme song. And she goes, okay, Frank, uh, what are you thinking for the move? He goes, the move. Um, well, I don't know, Ruth, you'll, you'll come up with something. Uh, I don't know, you know, maybe, because it's going to be on at night, maybe it'll be the last song we play, and we'd say Sweet Dreams might be something like that. And she goes, okay, all right. Well, listen, Frankie, let me play around with it. I'll get back to you in a few days. And, let's, and he says, ooh, that's a problem. A problem, Frankie? Yeah, I need the song tomorrow. And she <laughs> goes, what, tomorrow? I can't write a song tomorrow. And he says, oh, sure you can. You're good at this, babe. You told me you wrote on Leverett's Wall again overnight. And she goes, yeah, but Frankie, that was different. And he goes, okay, I got to go. There's so much to do. Call me tomorrow, Ruthie. Bye. And hangs up. And she's sitting there going, how the hell am I going to write a song overnight for, it's going to be heard by millions of people for the biggest talent in the world at this point. So um, what she does, she's a smart lady. She calls her friends Paul Mann and Stefan Weiss, a uh, songwriting duo she knows from the Bill Drill Building in New York. And these guys write songs, and some of them work, some of them don't. And when something doesn't work, they kind of put it on the shelf as maybe a half finished song. So she calls them up, explains her situation. They laugh at her, and she says, guys, you got to help me. you got to have written a piece of music. And they say, well, we've got something we've been playing with. So uh, make a long story short, they, the three of them pull on all nighter. And at noon the next day, Ruthie calls Frank. She puts the uh, pia the uh, phone down the piano, and she sings and plays uh, uh, the song, Put Your Dreams Away. And there's nothing. She goes, Frankie? And she goes, he hates it. And he goes, I love it. It's the best <laughs> song I've ever heard. Play it again. And that night, it, uh, it goes on the air on CBS and becomes his theme song. And Steve, as you said, the very last song played at his funeral in 1998. 
Unbelievable. Well, we should yeah. point out at this point that, that Ruth does remarry. And yes. one of the products of her second marriage is a young kid named Tommy Sandler. And people yes. around this town may know Tom Sandler as a fantastic photographer who is really the keeper of the flame of the Ruth Lowe story. And I remember he was on this program a few years ago, and I remember asking him, do you think, um, do you think Frank ever hit on your mother? And Tom, <laughs> Tom's answer to me, Peter, was, well, I do yeah. have blue eyes, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I? Okay, I'm not going there, but tell us about how, tell us how Tommy has kept his mother's legacy alive all these years. Well, he has. Uh, and, and Tommy, by the way, was named by his mom after Tommy Dorsby. How cool is that? Uh, but, uh, yeah, he has, um, he's been doing his best. Uh, she was given an Oscar. Uh, she has been uh, inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. Uh, she's going to be inducted into the American Songbook Hall of Fame. And um, Tom has been, uh, he, he reveres his mother. And so he's been keeping her name alive. And, you know, uh, Steve, I know you're aware of this because you've written about it. Why isn't Ruth Lowe in the Canadian Hall of Fame, uh, not Hall of Fame, the Walk of Fame? Why isn't there an award named after her in the Junos? You know, um, the U.S. does such a great job of honoring their heroes. And here in Canada, we, we don't seem to do that as well. Tom's been very big about getting his bums you know, renowned, uh, known, and darn it, it should be. She, she was an enduring musical star of the 19th, uh, yeah, the 20th century. Hmm. Well, Ruth Lowe died on January 4th, 1981. She had a 10-year yes. fight with cancer. Uh, that's 40 years ago next month that she died. 40 years mm -hmm. ago already. She was only 66 years old. Sheldon, why don't we bring up that picture here? Her final resting place, there it is. Look at yeah. that beautiful treble clef. Uh, yeah. on her headstone. Uh, Tommy had that put there, by the way. Yeah, that's beautiful. That is really beautiful. She also, you know, Tom, I know Tommy says, uh, you know, uh, he's so glad that you wrote this book because he wants his mother's legacy to remain. He doesn't want her story forgotten. And um, and one of the ways it's happening, Sheldon, let's bring up the next picture here. This, well, is, this is Ruth Lowe's great granddaughter, Allie, who did a school project on her great grandmother. How great is that? And and she got an A, by the way. <laughs> and she got what? Sorry. She got an A for for a mark on the project. Well, I'm glad to hear that, as she should have. But <laughs> yeah. what's? Yeah, I mean, take us down the road there. She has been so honored uh, in the United States, but not so much in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. I presume part of the reason you wrote this book is to change that. Steve, I hope so. Uh, it was an honor for me to be selected by Tom to write the book. Uh, it, it truly was an honor. And uh, because I, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Ruth Lowe and the contribution she made to uh, music around the world. So uh, to be selected to write and tell a smile at you was, uh, was a great honor. And yes, I hope the book will help to keep her name on high. It will help to get her into the... Uh, the, the Walk of Fame, and, and let's get a Juno Award named after her. I mean, we need to revere these uh, incredible stars like Ruth Lowe. Amen to that. Peter Jennings has written, Until I Smile at You, How One Girl's Heartbreak Electrified Frank Sinatra's Fame. Peter, it's awfully good of you to spend some time with us here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Steve, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it very much. Tomorrow on the Agenda. If you think you hate movement, you might you might need to just find the form that works for you right now in your life, and to trust the process of change. Um, because you know we all know that when you when you exercise, your muscles change, and that takes time. We know that your heart changes, your heart gets stronger when you exercise, but it takes time. And the same is true with your brain. But what most people don't understand is that the way your brain changes when you exercise is your brain actually learns to enjoy it more to actually want it. And your brain changes in other ways that make you more resilient to stress and more sensitive to all forms of joy. That's tomorrow on The Agenda. She toured extensively with David Bowie, collaborated with astronaut Chris Hadfield on a recording done from the space station, and has been nominated for numerous honors, including Canadian Folk Awards and Juno Awards. But as for many of us, this year has been all about change. 
And singer-songwriter M. Griner's new album, A Jazz Offering, captures that in spades. It's called Just For You. And there is M. Griner, now in St. Mary's, Ontario, home of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, just south of Stratford. Hello, M. It's so nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Well, let's start by getting to know you a little bit better, starting with that first name, M, E-M-M. -M. What's the story there? You're really starting from the beginning. Uh, well, um, it's a name I actually gave myself in college. And you know, the decisions we make in college are important. So um, I was actually born Mary, and I didn't really like how that sounded as a rock and roll name. So I just changed my name. And where did the E-M-M -M come from? From the M of Mary. Yeah. Gotcha. It's kind of like Erica M, the VJ, who took M as her last name because <laughs> her real last name starts with M and is too long to pronounce, she says. Yeah, if we went out for dinner, it'd get very confusing. <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, at what age were you when you started singing, writing songs, all of that? I was around 10. I wrote songs about nature. Um, and then I discovered boys, so I started writing about boys. And um, from there, it really grew. I started writing about my family and coming of age and um, just really loved songwriting. That was my first love. Now, you didn't exactly grow up a stone's throw from all of the biggest mu music studios in the world in downtown Toronto or Los Angeles or something. You grew up, do I have this right? You're outside Sarnia? Forest? That's right, yes. In between Sarnia and Forest. Okay, so how does somebody even begin to think about a professional music career from there? Well, it was pretty much all I could think about because there was nothing to do but feed some chickens and um, shop at the mall, the Lambton Mall. Woo -woo. <laughs> um, so actually, you know, um, a friend of mine, Larry Gowan, he said, boredom creates invention. Out of boredom comes invention. And that's what, what childhood was. There was literally nothing to do. So I just wrote songs and, um, and listened to music. It's funny you call him Larry Gowan because, of course, he's, he's only Gowan now, right? He dropped the Larry a long time ago. Oh, gosh. Well, I don't know. I can't keep track of anything in pandemic. So. <laughs> That's a good point. Can we show a little clip? Of course we can. It's our show. We can do whatever we want. No, we want to show a clip of you singing back up for somebody who's, well, he's a bit of a legend, shall we say? Sheldon, let's see this, please. Em, how did that come to you? You and David Bowie. Yeah, well, literally one weekend in 1999, I was playing at the Forest Fall Fair on a flatbed truck. And a week later, I was on Saturday Night Live with Bowie. And it was just the, um, I suppose it was that I was dropped from my record label um, in 1998. <laughs> and then I just felt free to go anywhere. So I went to New York and I did some shows and that's when I met his bandmates and they brought me into the band. Well, we should say the record label dropped you because it was an ownership change. So you were one of the casualties in all of that. But, uh, you know, as a backup singer, how well do you get to know the guy who's at the front of the stage? Really well, actually. Um, David was really, he treated his band like family and, you know, we, we went out for dinners together and, um, I really got to glimpse a side of him that not many people would. Um, and I learned so much from him. You know, there was obviously the celebrity side of it, which was great hotels and flying all over the place and famous people. But there was also the curiosity. He was very um, joyful and um, energized. And I took that as a huge lesson as someone who was transitioning from a big label back to my own career. Hmm. Now, how about Chris Hadfield on Space Oddity? How did that come to you? Uh, Chris and I are both from the Sarnia area. Um, He's got an airport named after him, and you've got some work <laughs> to do on that one, I think. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so we had become friends because I wrote a song about him, uh, about one of his missions. Um, I called it Christopher. And it appears on my um, Juno-nominated album, Asian Blue. And uh, we became friends. And then when he became commander of the space station, he called up uh, from space and said, would you like to collaborate on some music? So um, I'd just given birth to my second child and, you know, a dirty diaper in one hand and the phone <laughs> in the other hand. And I said, yes. That's motherhood, right? Multitasking all the time. <laughs> it's true. 
Now, it's interesting. I've talked to many female artists over the years who, once they have children, uh, life obviously becomes very different from a practical point of view, but their inspiration for their work also becomes different. Did you go through that as well? Yes. I mean, I think life changed dramatically when I had kids, um, just in terms of uh, seeing the truth in life. Um, I'm not sure I really took a good look at myself until kids popped out of my body. Um, so I think when you see that truth, it changes your art and it changes what you write. And I went through a huge transformation as a result of having them. I mean, there was obviously the loss of time. But um, what I lost in time and energy, I eventually kind of got back f with with so many other gifts. So, you know, I know there's a lot of young moms that struggle in the early years. I, I certainly did. But um, you sort of barrel through and you find your way. I know we've had Amy Skye on this program before. And when she had children, it, it completely changed the way she regarded the music business. It changed the way she, it changed what she wanted to write about, what she wanted to sing about. I mean, it was a very, very important 180 in her life. Did you experience mm -hmm. anything that profound, do you think? Well, absolutely. And I think in the last five years, I've gone through a huge transformation where I've really tried to be, um, you know, as a musician and a pop star, you kind of, an indie pop star, you sort of have the focus on yourself the whole time, right? So then when you have kids, you, you start to look outward. And I think looking outward has been a huge shift for me in the last few years. You know, it's like, what kind of a mom do I want my daughter to see? What kind of woman do I want my daughter to be around? Um, would I like her to see me doing the things that I love? Um, and also, would I like her to see me loved and happy? So a lot of changes happen for the better because of them. Understood. The new album is called Just For You, and we should start by asking, first of all, who's the you? The you is my dad, Jim. Shout out to dad. He's actually the first person who introduced me to TVO, you know, many, many... Many, many nights watching TVO. Um, That's good parenting. <laughs> yeah. So watching lots of movies. Um, but at that same time that we were, I was young, my dad introduced me to a lot of jazz. And it was the last thing I wanted to listen to. I just wanted to listen to Def Leppard and Madonna. Um, but in recent years, I've really fallen in love with it and seen um, another side of it. And I wanted to make him an album of songs that he chose. So I literally said one Father's Day, you know, instead of giving him a Tim Hortons tin of coffee, I said, I'll make you an album. So tell me what the songs are. And within 10 minutes, he wrote out all the songs. Good decision. I, I got to ask, <laughs> when, when's his birthday? Uh, September 10th. Okay. The reason I ask is you and I are a day apart. And my dad also introduced me to jazz. So if their birthdays were a day apart, I was going to say there's something very, very kismet going on here, but there's not because my dad's in August, so it's a month apart. Let's show some... It's pretty close, but not that close. Let's, uh, let's see some butterflies, shall we? Or we'll, we'll listen to some butterflies anyway. Sheldon, next clip, please. There were butterflies and skies of blue But now nothing goes as we play Trying to understand Cause I never thought we'd see the day When those butterflies are miles away mm. First of all, two things. Number one, the camera loves you. Number two, <laughs> what a voice. You've got such a beautiful voice. And, and number three, a bunch of interesting choices there that I want to get into right now. Namely, the idea to do this kind of home movie style. What's the, what's the thinking there? Well, it's a pandemic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and also, I, in recent years, I've really realized you can do a lot with a little. And um, this song, you know... It just needed me singing it somewhere. So I just literally took the camera around with me and a friend of mine, Daryl Latima, 
just put it together in his living room. And I think that's one thing about this time. I know it's a struggle for many people, but there has been like a emphasis on like, let's be resourceful. Let's be creative. Let's just uh, be a bit grateful for what we have. And that was shot where? Just around my house in the backyard. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny because it looks like, of course, it, it, it has the richness uh, to it that suggests that you had a whole team of people sitting around, you know, in an office somewhere for hour upon hour and think about, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to figure this shot out here? And we need this background and uh, uh, none of that, eh? None of that. Just ad living no. with a camera. Yeah, and thanks for saying that because I do. I have had those experiences, as a lot of musicians have, of that team making a video, and sometimes it doesn't turn out that well when you've got like 50 people working on it. So, um, you know, I I do love to tell people like you can do this, like you can make a video, you can make an album on your own, and I've always I've been saying this for two decades. So, how much of a departure is that style of singing for you from what you've done heretofore? That's a good question. I mean, my fans who have been so great, they just fund album after album and stay with me through crazy changes. Um, this album was a surprise for them. But I think that I've always just loved song, like great songs with great melodies and all different kinds of singers. So with myself, I love to explore different kinds of singing. So I have a rock band and, you know, I, I, try to sing as high as Ronnie James Dio. Um, but then I also have this softer side and I think it's okay to like embrace all of those sides. So to be honest, singing this way was very natural. It was a one take thing. Um, I was singing with the band and it just felt good. So. Oh, oh, never mind that it's acceptable. It's fabulous that you did it. And, and you know, lots of people like Rod Stewart get to a certain point in life where they say, you know, I want to try finding a different side of me. And he's done, you know, obviously a number of jazz al albums that turned out very well. And this one I'm sure will for you as well. Have you, have you had feedback from the fans on what they think? Yeah, I, and I'm so thrilled that I hear the same thing over and over that, you know, I didn't know that I like jazz or I didn't, I'm not usually a jazz fan. And mind you, I'm a pop singer, right, primarily. So there's going to be an element of jazz pop to this, but it was new for me. Uh, it was new for me to listen to the music a little differently, find the beats differently. Um, so it was a challenge for me. It was a challenge for my fans, but I think everyone's really enjoyed it. Now, as you and your chief of staff, namely your father, went through the list of songs that he either did or did not want to see on the album, how did you work all that out? Well, my dad picked 10 songs. Eight of them are standards that... Um, made it on the album, like Cry Me a River, Orange Colored Sky, Nevertheless, songs like that. But he did pick a song called My Heart Belongs to Daddy, <laughs> which I just started of course he did. working on it. And it was just like, Dad, this is that's where I draw the line. So I just put some of my own songs on instead, which, you know, he loves the originals too. So And Butterflies was one of the ones you wrote. Yes, I wrote it with a guy named Joe Corcoran, who is a Canadian living in L.A. And... Um, yeah, it was, I really love how it turned out. You did the whole LA thing for a while too, yes? I did, yeah, I lived there for, well, I lived there for a year. And? Too much sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> I love the seasons, which seems odd to say, seeing as uh, I'm buried in snow right now. But um, yeah, I, I think it's great to like travel and visit new places. Um, I'm just such a Canadian girl and I find so much inspiration um, living back in the area where I was a teenager. And I think there's a lot like that we can access about our joy when we kind of go back to our roots in a way. Um, so I, yeah, LA, maybe LA would be great right now for a week. For a week, yeah, yeah. Well, we're delighted to have been able to repatriate you. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I would like to know how, um, mortified or ticked off or whatever you find the right word you're trying to launch a new product in the middle of a global pandemic when no one can gather to hear you play what's that like that's a really good question um i think well 
I and en- I ended my fundraising for this album right when the pandemic began, and I was shocked that I could raise this kind of money when something like that was sort of reaching people as a reality. Um, to put the record out in the pandemic, it's it's actually been pretty amazing. I've been able to meet a lot of new people in the jazz world. Like that's the bonus of doing something new at this time, because normally I would put an album out, have a publicist and like do the rounds. But with this, I really like I got on the phone to people. Um, I really learned about some of these jazz writers and jazz journalists and it's provided more connection and it's provided more closeness. And um, even though I'm not playing like a big launch party, I did play uh, in my parents' backyard. <laughs> Socially <laughs> distanced, I hope. I, yeah, I, you know, they are actually in a gazebo, so it was more than socially distant. It was <laughs> almost like uh, someone was in jail or something. But um, yeah, it, it's been great, and I've been playing in driveways for senior citizens here in my town. It's there's a joy in it that is different from the regular. You know, you just have to think differently. Well, I got to follow up on that because the notion that you could actually experience deeper connection or more profound connection at a time when you're really not supposed to be near anybody and only talking to people over Zoom, as opposed to with a big launch party where you're actually going to sell a lot of units and be cheek by jowl with all sorts of people. How, how, explain that to me. How is it more, how is the connection deeper this way? Well, I think, you know, I mean, like even you and I right now, Steve, (laughs) it's like, I can see you, I can see me. And I think even with my fans, like we are doing these Zoom calls and online stuff, I wouldn't have been doing that if this wasn't going on. So I think that it's just been a little bit of a shift in, um, expectations, I guess, right? Um, And seeing some of the new ways that you can connect with people. It might not be quantity, but I definitely feel like there's such a quality of connection um, if you make the effort, right? Like, I know I did not want to get on Zoom with anyone when this started, really. (laughs) But But now you got no choice. This is the way this is the way we do business nowadays. It is the way. And it's weird. You get a chance to see yourself. And that's another thing, you know, like we're if you if there was any time to like really take a look at yourself, literally, and maybe deeper than that, now is the time. Well, there has been a lot of innovation and ingenuity by yourself, by other artists as they try to get their their goods and their, their wares and their talent out to the world. Um, one wonders, though, whether all of this disappears once the pandemic is over and we've all got our shots or whether this is a new way of doing business that will be more permanent? What do you think? It's a really good question. It's hard to tell the future. Um, I fear that we might go back to kind of just the normal rat race. I would say 90% of everyone I speak to, and maybe the viewers feel the same, have felt, you know, if they've had a, you know, a chance to breathe during this time, um, they've, they wanted the break. Um, so I try to tell some of the people I work with, I do a lot of vocal coaching. I try to tell them, you know, what is it about this time that is working for you and take it with you past this, uh, past the end of it. You know, we, I feel like we are, we've just been all maxed out a little bit. Well, uh, let me just conclude by saying as connected as I feel to my fellow Gemini born one day apart in the month of June, I do look forward to the day when I'm actually allowed to bump your elbow or shake your hand, God forbid, um, and do this in person, because this was great fun, and I'm so delighted to meet you, and I wish you just great good fortune with Just For You, your latest. Thanks a lot, Em. Thanks, Steve. See you. One of the sectors in our economy that has suffered the most during this pandemic is arts and culture. For example, how do you keep alive a music venue when gathering for concerts is just not on? Well, let's find out. Heidi Van Vlyman is general manager of the Jazz Bistro. It's one of downtown Toronto's most beautiful places to go hear the best jazz artists around. But it's been pretty quiet lately. And Heidi Van Vlyman joins us now from just off the young Dundas Square in the heart of the provincial capital. And Heidi, it's great to meet you. How are you doing tonight? 
I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Not at all. It's great to meet you. Um, can you start by telling us what's going on at the Jazz Bistro these days? Well, it's very quiet around here, and I must say it's uh, it's a little bit uh, sad not to have music in these halls. Um, when we first had the first lockdown, uh, it was uh, a little bit shocking, and uh, moving forward, we had uh, decided to do a little bit of streaming, and it almost made me cry because it had been so dead and quiet for so long in these rooms and halls, and to hear music, live music again, was just amazing. So it's it's... It's something to have it, it quiet. It shouldn't be quiet. I mean, it's your job, but you, you love the music and clearly miss it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. miss it. I went on your website the other day, and I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osman, just to bring up a shot. Now, there's what the glorious-looking jazz bistro normally looks like, but then right at the bottom of the screen, and I'll read this out loud for those who are listening on podcast and can't see it themselves, temporarily closed due to COVID-19 modified stage 2 restrictions. How often do you get people going to the website saying, dang, we were really hoping you were open and that's not the news we wanted to hear? Yeah, absolutely. We get it a lot. And uh, we had uh, events kind of scheduled that have been postponed based on uh, news that uh, uh, health, uh, uh, Toronto Health is, is put forward. And it keeps getting uh, pushed to another date, another date, another date. And now we're completely closed and I don't imagine anything will happen until the new year. Um, so it's, it's, you know, we have people calling and, and, and looking to book and I'm like, we can't be open. So I'm not sure where they're getting their information or how they're not knowing what's going on. But, uh, yeah, we have, uh, a lot of people and the artists, it hits the artists the hardest cause they have been pretty much locked up in their houses streaming, uh, since March. And it's just different when you have a live audience in front of you. It's, uh, you know, for us uh, as 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 uh, providers of the of the venue and and servers, and it's just a different um, experience when you have people reacting to what you're giving them, whether it's uh, live music, the food. Like it's it's just a sad state of affairs. Yeah. How often are you getting emails or phone calls from either talent agents or musicians saying? Are you taking bookings yet for next year or when do you think you're going to be back open or all of that kind of stuff? We do. We get a lot of requests and people are, you know, thinking into the future and putting their name in there fast and and we get a lot. Our um, music director, James B, he's the one who books the room um, and he does a fantastic job uh, and they are constantly coming in. This is J-A-Y-M-Z-B-E-E. -E. James has got a That's funny right. way of spelling his name, but he's a super guy. Yes. <laughs> Tell me this. When was the last time you opened your doors and had, you know, a reasonably full hall of people listening to great music? Well, I mean, we opened on uh, the end of July uh, when um, the city gave us that wonderful Cafe T.O., um, which honestly was a great thing that they did for Toronto, and I hope they keep that moving forward because um, it really gives such a cafe and, and you know, uh, European feel to our streets, and, and I think it's wonderful. So it gave us an opportunity to open the doors, play music from our sound system that we uh, normally have, and put it out onto the street. Um, then we had, um, for the month of August, when we were allowed to bring people in, we were allowed up to 50 people. So social distancing, and along with all the other music venues and restaurants and, and such, we spent a lot of money and a lot of time making sure that we were compliant. So tables six feet apart, um, only 50 people, screens on the stage behind me so that if horns or people were singing, that uh, the plexiglass would, um, you know, keep people safe from any kind of, uh, you know, trans transmission or whatever. And we, we did everything that we needed to do and it was wonderful. Uh, even though we could only have so many people in the restaurant, it, it was great. The, the artists loved it. We loved it. Our last Last show was October 3rd, um, and our owner, he closed out with a, a big bang. And with 50 people allowed in the venue, we were quite able to fill uh, our seats. Uh, normally, we can have, you know, up to 200 people because um, we have two floors that can enjoy the music. So we have uh, a mezzanine level and uh, the main level. And then you can always make room for tables, but now there's no 
no squeezing. It's uh, it is 50, <laughs> and that's it. So it's more than two months since you've really had anybody in there playing. Absolutely. What a shame. How many? What is your complement of staff under normal circumstances? Well, normally we have a full kitchen, which is runs about uh, you know. 15 um, cooks and the chef and on the floor the same thing we have about 15 servers and then the sound technicians and uh, myself and managers so it's getting close to 40 then yes and have you had to lay everybody off yes we have it's sad i mean everybody it's it's hard it's really been hard on the staff um a lot of them are uh, young young people and you know the restaurant industry is often a stepping stone to to bigger and and, and broader dreams um for some people um and it's it's been a hard and a hard go you know and we're trying to do things to supplement but it's it's difficult to you know to keep everybody working and and our owners are wonderful and they do their best uh, since the first breakdown uh, the first uh, lockdown in March they did their absolute best to make sure that everybody still had some income still had something to do I mean obviously we have three floors here it's a huge venue and there's always something to do so they made sure that they took care of the um, the, the staff as best they could for as long as they could but at some point you know, there has to be a time when, when you know, you have to lay people off and hope for the best. Let me, let me ask you a couple of financial questions here. You mentioned that you'd spent a lot of money to get the place up to the standards of the provincial protocol so that you could re reopen and have everybody be safe. Can you tell us how yep. much money you spent to do all that? I would say thousands of dollars. I mean, we bought um, all the equipment. We replaced all the um, the sanitizing machines so that they're, they're um, hands-free. Uh, we had to get screens, we had to move the dividers around, get dividers for the tables, get, you know, um, uh, for the bar, there's all, it's all cordoned off. Everything is, has uh, plexiglass and dividers and, and that costs, uh, that costs money, which, you know, we understand and we're absolutely willing to do to keep people safe. And we heard so many times from, from guests coming in. Uh, they really appreciated the effort that we were making to make sure that people were safe. We had uh, a nurse that came and um, he worked at Mount Sinai and he came down and shook my hand and he said, you know, I want to thank you. Uh, you've got a, a pass from Mount Sinai and I thought that was kind of nice. He shook your hand. Well, you'd have to bump your elbow today, right? No handshaking anymore. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, for those who've got really good memories and who have watched TVO for a long time, your place used to be called the Top of the Senator, and we used to bring camera crews down there quite frequently, and we used to shoot what was going on there, and we'd do interviews with the musicians. But then the place went under new ownership, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm not sure you were there when the ownership changed hands, but they literally spent millions, right? Millions changing the old Top of the Senator to the new Jazz Bistro. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely millions of dollars, yeah. And I mean, how, it's a completely different venue right now. It really is. And how, if, if, I mean, this is a hard question to ask, but if, if you don't get this place open and earning revenue soon, is there a danger that the bistro is going to disappear? Well, and, you know, our owners are committed. So they are committed to um, keeping live music avail uh, uh, um, around the city. This is a beautiful venue. They've worked very hard. Um, over the years, uh, implementing, you know, different kinds of music, world music, you know, changing the, the um, kind of, you know, uh, getting just different jazz from all around the world. And um, the bonus is that we own the building, or we, my owners own the building. So that is a, a little bit of a blessing. Um, it helps um, I don't know how other people are doing it. I really don't. And so many jazz venues and, and, and clubs in the city have gone under and to, we just can't have another one go under. Our musicians need us. We need them. Um, so our owners are committed. I mean, it's not, it's not an easy, you know, there's money going out the door in droves. Um, but we are going to try and, and come back and make sure that we're here for our artists and our staff and the city. So just to f further understand this, if you own the building, you're not having to pay rent to a landlord. There is that. But presumably, you've still got electricity pr uh, costs. You've still got uh, property taxes to pay. There was a bit of a holiday a few months ago, but that holiday is over. 
Uh, what other expenditures have, have you got to deal with now with no revenues coming in? Well, I mean, like you said, the running costs keep coming, so that doesn't change. So, you know, we just had the heating, we had to, um, a $3,000, like it's just constant, constant maintenance, upkeep. And like I said, it's, it's we own the building, but then we own all the problems. So, uh, you know, the, the, the heating, the roof, the, the leaks, everything that happens in a building, and it just keeps the money still needs to come to pay all those things and, and, and to keep the, the lights on. Now, Heidi, this is uh, admittedly a bit of a controversial question, but here goes anyway. You know that there are some people in our society who have been protesting quite frequently about the fact that so much of society has been locked down. Uh, some of these people don't want to wear masks at all. Some of them think that the cost of small businesses like yours has been too high. Um, I guess I want to know whether you and your owners uh, fall into that category of people who think the reaction has been too strong and that you wish you could open at least a little bit and have something going on there. What do you think? Well, that's an interesting question because we do have an opinion on that. I mean, masks 100%. Anybody that, uh, you know, feels like masks are, are something that you don't need to wear, I think it's an easy thing to do to keep everybody safe and to, you know, whatever your beliefs are, it just keeps peace and, and, and makes everybody feel um, like everybody's doing their part. Uh, as far as the venues and the way it's been rolled out is is interesting and a little confusing at times. It's not very clear as to what is expected. So when we had the patios, um, we were closed inside, but you could have the patios. And then, you know, but initially you couldn't cover the patios because then it was a, a closed enclosure. Then people started closing their patios. It's just not very clear. So I think um, it needs to be a little bit more clear. And honestly, like so many of these small shops, like ourselves, were considered um, small in the fact that we're um, a singular owned there's not multiple locations that we have so we've taken the time to make sure that everybody is safe and we can actually um control that as, as the same with right now everybody else i mean the small bookstores and whatever they are easy enough to control one person in at a time you know it's 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 something that i think putting this blanket closure on everybody if there's a certain area that's a problem i think it's more house parties and home parties and those kinds of things as opposed to venue problems or um business problems i mean the biggest controversy obviously is the box stores that are allowed to be open and i don't know you've been there i've been there there's no social distancing happening there and you know so i don't understand and we don't understand how having you know 50 people in a very organized um, situation where they could hear live music, you know, we didn't have any problems. And I was very diligent on making sure that people stayed in their seats, had their masks on when they were, if they had to go to the washrooms, everything was tight. And to just shut it down blanketly so that all these small businesses can't make a penny and a box store gets all the revenue and it just, it doesn't make sense to me. It just, and we wanted people to stay safe. 100%, wear your masks, follow the rules. But for those of us that have hard to make sure we're um, staying on top of keeping everyone safe, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit much right now. And to the best of your knowledge, none of your kitchen staff, none of your audio technicians, nobody who works there has contracted a case of COVID-19 from working there. No, absolutely not. So you're convinced that you could open the doors even now with the enhanced protocols in place and for admittedly a smaller audience, you could open to live music safely. You're convinced you could do that? We, I mean, the owners are following the protocol. So if it says that we are to be closed, we are happy to be closed. We're happy to follow the rules. That being said, I think, you know, based on, um, the protocols that we've taken and the the measures that we've taken to keep people safe i believe we can keep people safe but we're not gonna you know fight to 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 go against what you know the uh, the city and the and the government has decided we will go along and 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 follow the rules absolutely but we we went to very big measures to make sure that we are safe and and we did a really good job at it um 
I had mentioned to someone before that, you know, if they had just maybe deputized a few people and just walk around the city and just walk in and in two minutes, you can tell if they're compliant or not. And then shut them down, not for 28 days, but shut them down for a week and get them to fix it. Like, I don't have the answers. The numbers are going up. So, you know, we all need to do our part. Um, but live music and, and the entertainment industry and food service is suffering and it's going to be a long road back. Hmm. Can you tell us whether there were any programs uh, introduced by any level of government, federal, provincial or municipal, that were helpful to you during this time? Yes, well, we had uh, to take advantage of the... Oh, municipal tax holiday? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, and um, uh, the wage um, rebate. So the supplement for anybody that you're um, paying, um, that helped a lot. I mean, that really, we appreciate it immensely. It doesn't change the fact that um, it's still a very big negative that we're dealing with, um, but it definitely definitely helped and we, re we really appreciate the help. Hmm. Well, speaking of appreciate, we really appreciate your taking some time to come on TVO tonight and explain your situation there. And I can't tell you, I'm sure I speak for thousands when I say we can't wait for the doors to be open again so that we can get back to the Jazz Bistro and hear some live music. You take care, Heidi, okay? Thank you for having me. Not at all. That's Heidi Van Vlyman, who's the general manager at the Jazz Bistro in downtown Toronto. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. Coming up right after this program, you might want to check out the documentary about Canada's ambassador of jazz, saxophonist Jim Galloway. It airs next on TVO, or you can, of course, catch it anytime on our website. Now, tomorrow, as the most populous parts of Ontario remain in lockdown, we'll hear from public health officials about the prospects for flattening the COVID-19 curve as we head into the holiday season. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.